whether you are joining us in person or online, welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. My name is Joseph Sani, and I head the Africa Center at the Institute. The US Congress established the Institute in 1984 to help prevent, resolve, and mitigate conflicts abroad. One of our major priorities at the US Institute of Peace is to support peaceful, democratic, political transitions from West Africa to the Sahel to the Great Horn of Africa. We recognize the Sahel significant importance uh, in global stability, security, and prosperity. That's why today we are organizing this important conversation to discuss the challenges and opportunities in the Sahel and also address the need for a comprehensive US strategy. It is a great honor to host this special event with Ambassador Tamisa Kamara, who will be moderating this esteemed panel. Ambassador Kamara is a senior advisor at the United States Institute of Peace. She also chairs the US uh, senior study uh, group on the Sahel. Uh, the, the study group published a report last month, and then you have physical uh, copies in the room. And also you have, you can have a soft copy online. Ambassador Kamara is an African policy analyst and practitioner with rich and deep experience on foreign policy, including serving as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mali, Minister of Digital Economy and Planning, and also the Chief of Staff to the President. We are delighted that Ambassador Kamara will lend her expertise in navigating these complex issues and topics in discussion with our esteemed panel. With that said, I will then turn over to Ambassador Kamara to lead us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sunny, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for joining us for this important discussion on peace, security, and prosperity in the Sahel. Today's agenda covers a broad spectrum of critical issues from the region's security challenges to the role of the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS. We will explore why the US government should intensify its focus on the Sahel and evaluate strategies to make headway in a region plagued by violent insurgencies and currently marked as the world's most extensive contiguous area under military rule. So this will be a bilingual panel with our panelists speaking either in French or English and me in both. We have language interpretation with headsets available. Channel one is in English and channel two is in French. So please see a team member if you need assistance uh, with the headset service. Following the discussion, we invite the in-person and virtual audience to join the conversation. If you're in the room, there will be an opportunity to ask a question and a microphone will be uh, passed to you. For those following online, uh, you can pause a question in the chat box on the event webpage or use the hashtag Sahel Peace on social media. And a member of our staff will read some of the questions received online. All right, so I am honored to introduce our panel of distinguished experts and practitioners who bring a wealth uh, of knowledge and experience on the Sahel. Their insights will be key as we navigate these complex topics today. Ambassador Bisa Williams, good morning. Good morning. You are the co-founder and managing director of William Strategy Advisors, LLC, and a former US ambassador to Niger. You led a 30 plus year career in foreign service with tours in Guinea, Panama, Mauritius, France, and the US mission <coughs> to the UN. As acting deputy assistant secretary of state for Western hemisphere affairs, you led the US delegation to talks in Havana, Cuba, <coughs> breaking a seven-year hiatus on, of high-level direct discussions. After returning from Ambassador to Niger, you were named Deputy Assistant Secretary for State for African Affairs. You more recently uh, led the Carter Center's effort 
as independent observer of the implementation of the peace agreement in Mali. We are glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Monsieur le ministre Tchema Hubert Koulibaly, bonjour. Bonjour. Vous êtes un homme politique malien, président du Parti Union pour le Développement uh, you are the head of et la the Union for Development, UDD. Development and Democracy, UDD, UDD Party, in, in uh, Mali. You have been a minister sometimes, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. You have served your country, or our country, rather, in very high-level roles. You were Minister of Foreign Affairs twice. You have been Minister of Defense, Minister of State Domains and Land Affairs, and Minister of Territorial Administration. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is a lot. You were also the special envoy of the OIF uh, in Guinea. You were also head of the observation mission of the OIF in the Comoros. You were also a full-time uh, business owner. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. <coughs> General Francis Béanzon. Hello. You are the co-president of the Worldwide Association of Security and Defense Professionals for Preventing and Fighting Terrorism. Correct. You have served in the Defense and Security Forces of Benin, and you have held very high-level roles, particularly within the Ministry of the Interior and Public Safety, as well as the National Police Administration. You have been a Commissioner for ECOWAS uh, for Political, Peace, and Security Affairs from 2018 to 2022. And formerly, you were Military Advisor to ECOWAS in Guinea-Bissau, and during your term at ECOWAS, you have managed 14 presidential elections, two Senate elections, and four parliamentary elections, all sensitive in the region. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Ambassador Williams, our senior study group report uh, suggests that the traditional reactive stance of Washington towards the Sahel, focusing on specific events, rather than a proactive engagement is both outdated and ineffective. Why should the U.S. government reconsider its engagement in the Sahel, especially when it has significant interests in other regions? And what makes the Sahel important for U.S. foreign policy? Well, thank you, Kamisa. And um, it really is important that we have this discussion. So I will jump right into that question. For a very long time, U.S. policy in Africa has not been a priority in general. I think post, uh, basically, let's even skip past 911 and go to 2011, with the fall of Libya, the attention turned to the Sahel for probably the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. in that security became the priority, um, <clears throat> without thinking about, well, who are the people there? What does the region have to offer? I think that the Sahel is important for the United States, not only for our national security, um, because of uh, but for our concerns about migration, let's do the negative column, if you will. People are concerned about the population boom in Africa. Um, four out of every five, or is that it? People on the planet by 2050 are going to be African of some sort. And that pressure, if there's not increased development on the continent, not just in the Sahel, but on the continent, it's going to put waves of people going into Europe, going over to the United States, et cetera. The United States has concerns about migration, mm -hmm. maybe that's a reason to be interested. The rare earth minerals that are going to, upon which we will be dependent, mm -hmm. and modern, modern world will be dependent as we go more into this century, are largely found in the Sahel region and on the, in the African continent. So there are, again, security, but also economic reasons for the United States to be involved. But I think the primary reason is that uh, the people of Africa, um, of whom I'm a descendant, let's say, have contributed so much to the world. They're building the world of human resource and the potential. We are allowing um, a whole region of people to uh, be deprived of resources, of education, of opportunity, and of the possibility to help make this a better place. So mm -hmm. I think that the United States need to, needs to reprioritize and say, what are ways we can have a partnership that is really collaborative mm -hmm and not a partnership that is um, more clientelist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so certainly there are security reasons. I think there are important economic reasons. I think there are important um, uh, alliance, uh, nation partnership building reasons that we should be paying attention to the Sahel and that we need to readjust what 
our priorities are and mm -hmm. why and why they happen. Thank you. So you've emphasized the term partnership, which shows up quite a lot in the um, U.S. foreign policy towards Africa, the recent one. Mm -hmm. And so I will use um, that term partnership and that principle to ask a question to um, Le Ministre Koulibaly. Um, Le Mali s'est retiré du G5 Sahel. Le pays, le pays a annulé ses accords de, de défense et de défense. Le pays a demandé le départ de la MINUSMA tout en faisant appel à des combattants de, de Wagner. Pensez-vous que nous sommes... Thank you, Madam. I would like to first off say that I agree with everything that Madam Williams said, uh, and I will come back uh, to this question of the economic economic aspect. But on uh, politics and policies, especially yeah. in terms of and foreign policy, this we are obliged to look at a new reality and the political de uh, decisions that were taken on concerning co cooperation partners for security, for defense in Mali, have led to a new reality. The decisions taken concerning the um, CE, the RECs, the local regional community, economic communities, are also part of this. All this needs to be looked at in uh, one frame, one view. So uh, we uh, need to find one voice to find uh, uh, a, a logistics that will fit the situation after the coup d'etat of 2020. So the rules of ECOWAS, uh, such as they were written starting in 1989, it was Mubarak uh, 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 who was at the head of ECOWAS at the time, it leads to there were a certain la number of principles and rules that came up from this. Mali finds itself in a situation that visibly cannot today, with those in command, cannot uh, for the moment uh, work with these rules, follow these rules. Uh, and of course, uh, these countries have uh, pulled away from uh, ECOWAS. I believe that the question rel relative to MINUSMA also uh, uh, has the same uh, intentions. But here we see all of this vacuum, but we have to look at the overall uh, frame. It's the crisis of multilateralism that we are seeing here. It is a reality. There is a true crisis of multilateralism. Today, these uh, things no longer function. Many countries, whether they're the countries of the Sahel or countries elsewhere, are uh, questioning whether uh, the good that actually can come of, of these situations. So we have to ask ourselves, what can we do? Uh, why is there not more room, for example, for Africa at the Security Council? Why do they not have a seat there? Uh, of course, uh, the Africa now is going to be part of the G21. That's an important economic aspect. But on the political and security levels, we have to uh, really observe uh, that what is happening currently is not functioning. And the regional uh, organizations from Africa, w whether it is the African Union or others, they are facing the same problems. I suppose you've all heard the speech of the uh, President Musaki, President of the Commission, at the last uh, African Union su summit. It leaves no doubt. It's very clear that we are in full crises in Africa. The most thorny questions are treated marginally, and the um, issues are extremely complex. And. I say this why because the reasons for these for the, the the positions taken by the governments of Burkina Faso of Mali and of Niger uh, 
they have particular situations, they have particular uh, situations, so they were not sure how they will uh, come out of this transition. But there's the difficulty of really addressing all of these questions on a national level. So one question should be that we need to bring in more balance in uh, multilateralism so that uh, uh, the, the international governments that were uh, uh, coming from uh, other countries, it's important that it's important that uh, Mali also be at the heart of this. What happens is that we are now seeing that it is the strong men who are the strongest who, who uh, have the power. We have violent persons in power. And often these are supported by forces uh, external to the region. This leads to a areas where there is a total absence of prosperity and of well-being, such as, as, our, uh, as Ambassador Williams mentioned, we cannot have prosperity in areas uh, that are in war and conflict. Uh, Mr. Minister, you've spoken of multilateralism, so I will now uh, turn the floor to General Beazat to see what is happening elsewhere. So does ECOWAS, has ECOWAS lost all of its legitimacy? Uh, one third of its members are um, led by military juntas, what could it have done, what could it have done otherwise, has it lost all credibility and legitimacy, we've after the coup d'etat uh, against President Bazou in Niger last year, we heard uh, there were a lot of threats, none of them um, actually have actually actualized, been actualized, thank you, I will first start by responding to your question. As the Vice President of the Institute USIP, Mr. Sani, hello to all. Hello to all. <laughs> I'm delighted to be a part of this important conversation on the Sahel, the region of West Africa. I I am uh, delighted to be here with you. I hope there are also some military here in the audience, but in civ civilian uniform, uh, but dressed as civilians. So, uh, as a military, it's so the military, it's important for the military to be present because they are also part of the people even if they have particular prerogatives there are many specialties nonetheless within the ranks of the army the police the different services the um, you have all all of them carry with them uh, potential political potentiality. And so it's important to uh, include them in this type of discussion. In terms of the credibility of ECOWAS, you know that all organization is uh, here is subject to turbulence. Even in the UN, there is turbulence. The reef when some people are always uh, asking and clamoring for ref reforms, changes. I, th there are many problems. I will not discuss them all. You know of many of them. But since 1975, uh, of its founding in 1975, ECOWAS is in continual uh, self-questioning. And it was we re it was noted that one needs uh, a strong economy to have prosperity to have to have and to have peace and uh, prosperity you have to have good policy good uh, good politicians because it's the government that will determine the direction of the country and having uh, served as I did. Uh, for four and a half years with much turbulence. I was fortunate to uh, work hand in hand and to, uh, on the si with, uh, with these two ministers. Uh, when 
in 2018, and then Ambassador Kamisa, who replaced him in the same position. Strategically, um, I was very close to the heads of state. My role in this uh, for four and a half years was not easy because one has to be uh, in direct contact with the uh, chief of uh, staffs of all the countries of the region. We included Chad and Mauritania because the Sahel concerns also these countries that had very specific organizations uh, fighting against terrorism. But the situation really took a downturn, and Minister Koulibaly is correct when he speaks of a crisis of multilateralism. This crisis of multilateralism, I would say, stems from, flows from, the hip hypocrisy of the international community. Let us be honest. Let us be serious. Let us be, uh, let us look to see to rea the reality in the field. We spoke of MINUSMA. We spoke of the retreat today of, uh, in Ma from Mali, of uh, 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 the, re uh, the retreat from Mali, Burkina, Niger, from uh, these organizations. And it is not the first time that countries are pulling away from a community, whether it's a regional community or international community or sectorial community. I do not believe this is the end of it because the discussions continue. There are uh, underground uh, conversations be the, with uh, s heads of state that take into account uh, the situation of our community, and they are reviewing things and uh, questioning things. I did say that for this kind of meeting, it's important to have military present as well. Even as an officer, I'm a defender of human rights, a member of the Commission of Human Rights since 1988. And today I am a member of the Admin Administrative Council of Benin. Uh, a, uh, s s an early to say that in the life of a nation, no sector should be marginalized or considered as neutral or silent. Even in Western states and European states, there are uh, <laughs> Coup d'etat, you have to look at the reasons that have contributed to these coup d'etat. And I do hope that with time, we will um, overcome this. And I do have hope for this. Thank you, General, for these comments. And Minister Koulabali and yourself have mentioned uh, the expected retreat of Mali, Burkina, and Niger from ECOWAS. Does this decision mark a, no re a decision of no return, or is really ECOWAS still alive? Is it still kicking? What do you think? I think that all power is temporal, temporary, yes. Uh, uh, there can be uh, a situation that other governments uh, question. We saw that Mauritania was a good member of uh, GICOAS, and it also pulled back, and then it asked to be an observer. Yes, but the context was not the same. And, and uh, then a full-fledged uh, full observer, observer, and then Morocco was considering entrance. There were some difficulties. And I believe that it is not the end of the world. It is not the end of the world because in truth and reality, one needs to see what were the causes of these situations. 
This is the question to ask even children when that we raise at home. The education that they receive at home from their families and from the world at large can lead them to have certain behaviors, either controllable or not. Myself, I am not I'm not pessimistic to the point of being it's not reversible, that these decisions are not reversible. We are um, t talking with them personally. I have uh, spoken with these, with most of these persons, but really on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, level, because these are people who, such as ourselves, sometimes find themselves very isolated, marginalized. You see them when you talk to them. You you can after you can speak to them, but once you have left. If you have spoken to them in a particular way, it is not going to be well received, and it, you will have had the advantage of being of working with close to uh, heads of state. You understand the difficulty at, in doing so. Monsieur le Ministre, I just say a word. Yes, sir. May I? There's something that's very clear. Right now, ECOWAS is broken. Merci de le dire. Thank you for saying so. We have to say it. ECOWAS is broken. Once again, it's, I, I'm not trying to attack ECOWAS by saying that. It's just an observation. Policy, especially when it gets to the transnational or supranational level, is an opportunistic position taking, which often commands action. I mean, we know that Mauritania left, right? Which made sense for Mauritania at the time. I mean, and 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 Morocco. There was that issue too. That saw saw an opportunity. We see it. We see a constant there. And in terms of d diplomacy, we have what I call constraining constants. Constraining constants. Constraining constants are geography, history, culture, the economy, which is always uh, which is always a factor that comes in. And you see this whole variety of factors that come into play, and it means that w any given state can't take, is not able to take a certain position at any given time sometimes. And whenever the, that specific context runs up against events, states make decisions that go against, that go against what the original fundamental doc doctrine was at a certain point. You know, you know the attempt at the customs union mm -hmm. in our area, that goes back to 1949. 1949, there was the idea for that customs union. The first leader of Mali, which was still called French Sudan, had already talked about with, with the council to try to build a customs union. So we can see those origins of that project. But at a certain point when the free trade zone, the African free trade zone was supposed to move forward, and we started talking about a, cur a common currency with an ECOWAS and how we could build a consistent economy. When we started to have to make decisions, it's, it started to be a real challenge for the organization. But let's not mistake anything. Withdrawing from ECOWAS, that is those case three countries that withdrew, for right now, doesn't really change anything economically. Why? Because there's, uh, there's the uh, West African Economic and Monetary Union, the UMOA, which covers all of the economic uh, systems and, and custom systems in particular that ECOWAS has, but then some additional measures in addition. 
So the economic impact of certain countries leaving ECOWAS, those three countries leaving, I'm not saying it's nothing, but it's not decisive. Now, let's say that after those three countries have decided to leave, that the Economic and Monetary Union Treaty falls apart. That would be a whole other thing. But right now, it's clear that ECOWAS is a broken organization. We can say that based on what we've seen, but also the overall crisis of multilateralism. Let's not ignore that. So we have to think. We have to think about how we can work, I including within our own areas, our own spaces. How can we make sure to make it clear that multilateralism is necessary? The, so that the world can be policed, because if we don't have multilateral principles, once again, it will just be a system of might makes right, and that is I unacceptable. That's what leads to nationalism, and as a French politician said, once you have nationalism, that leads to war. So, Please. I mean, this is an important question, yeah. um, and I agree with what the previous two speakers have already said, but I really do think that the, the withdrawal from ECOWAS mm -hmm. is symptomatic of the same international crisis that we're talking about. But it, that international crisis has to do with what are the principles now that everybody has decided to, uh, is deciding upon. And um, the notion of partnership, I, I almost dislike that word in this context, even though I used it, because up to now, Partnership has really been one way. It's been those who have approaching those who don't have as much, saying, "I have a, I have something. Let's let's be partners on it." So it was really a one-way street. And what we're, I think, part of what we're seeing, if there's a, if there's a legitimacy to some of this disruption that we're seeing in West Africa, in the Sahel specifically, is that there is an effort to create a different kind of balance, mm -hmm. and. When we look at, if, if there's no ECOWAS, there's going to have to be an organization that helps to unite and create a common dialogue mm -hmm. and common efforts among all those, number one, landlocked countries and all those countries that have so much in common, Co people, commerce, um, d water dependency, all the rest. So, um, and I think it's the discussion of what are the objectives, and once we get those objectives, our principles, our charter, how much are we willing to implement them and stand on them? And that is what has caused the crisis, let's say, in the UN. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we're going to put all our put all our efforts behind supporting a democracy, and sometimes we're not. So, um, and I think that partnership element, are we really talking um, with our African colleagues as equal partners? I mean, this is very sensitive. Can a US, I'm a former diplomat, but can a US diplomat then come and sit down and talk to Mali say, as two people who are friends with a long relationship together and really um, speak to each other as equals, saying, is this really the best route for you? Or, and I think the United States has been kind of hesitant to do that, um, saying, you know, well, it's an African discussion. We can only th let the Africans talk about it among themselves. And so even though we've got this larger con charter, this context, <laughs> we're going to let them ferret it out and, and be silent. So I think that that has to be part of um, uh, what we, how we go forward in our relations. And I'm and I'm not sure that everybody is ready to do that. Well, let me let me ask you this. So you you were a member of our senior study group for the Sahel, and in our report, we mentioned that the United States needs mm -hmm. to work multilaterally in the Sahel. Mm -hmm. So we don't have anything better than the ECOWAS at this point. What and how should the United States work? with the ECOWAS in this new reality? Well, I, actually, the U.S. took a, um, even when I was in the Foreign Service, um, we took a rather proactive role in ECOWAS to the extent that we asked for observer status, we wanted to let mm -hmm. you know that we were there, uh, and we do consultations. Um, and I believe the government, our government is still doing that. Um, but again, I think that there's this uh, sort of uh, schizophrenia when it comes to real crisis and how much the United States can impose itself, inject itself, mm -hmm. and sit down beside our African um, brothers and sisters and say, look, can't we solve this thing together? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a little bit of suspicion on the African side saying, well, we've not done much else together in that kind of way, so maybe we don't want you here. Um, uh, I, there, there is, 
I believe that the principles upon which ECOWAS was founded and for a long time worked pretty well. I mean, look what it did in Liberia, look what ECOWAS decided to do in Sierra Leone. Those seem to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, linked to this, uh, this current dysfunction or um, broken down period of ECOWAS also has to, um, is the, is what your local populations and your civil society knows about what is civic responsibility, what, what, are, what are we supposed to expect of our leaders and our governments. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the, you know, ECOWAS's threats against, about coming into Niger were blown out of the sky by Nigerian, by Nigerian um, civil society. They said, wait a minute, we don't want to attack our Nigerian, our Nigerian brothers. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, there was, there was a uh, big chasm between what officials were saying and they thought they could do and what, what people were willing to bear. And um, I think a big part of the problem, I had discussions with my Nigerian friends during the early part of that crisis. I said, well, you know, what is it that people are willing to fight for? Because in the United States, we say that very, we say it and we've gone through it here, we've had struggle um, and we continue to have struggle. Um, but this notion of, you know, there are some things we're willing to die for here. And interestingly, f for me, an eye opener was that people said, right now, our confidence in government, our confidence in leadership, our confidence, confidence in institutions is such a point, like, we're not willing to put anything on the line for any solution. So how can you have an organization that's supposed to be of leadership that are helping to guide mm -hmm. when your populations um, feel so um, abandoned or disinterested or mistrustful of you. So all those things go put, get put into the mix. Getting back to what the US do, um, we need to be more present, more active, and have a different relationship of partnership with our counterparts than we have had. So what does this new partnership look like? Um, what does it look like? Well, it looks like speaking it's it's not that not that expression of just speaking truth to power but it means to showing that we are there to help address the priorities that the people of a nation have established um, not just the political concerns that are ours but um, putting much more in development putting much more um, many more of our own resources, I think, into mm -hmm. the Sahel. Okay. Um, I've always been a big proponent of uh, Marshall Plans um, for Africa. I know it's a taboo term, um, but <coughs> it's necessary. Thank you. Monsieur le Ministre Koulibaly. Minister Koulibaly. <laughs> oh, oui, oui. Can I add, a, add something? Uh, uh, for, for Minister Koulibaly, could I add something for him? Thank you very much. I think we need to see things as they are. And that's a bit my specialty, in, especially in, in uh, military affairs. Just because I commanded a troop, some troops, uh, it was a time when one or two soldiers Deux, fell, mm -hmm. and two or three defected from the mission. It wasn't just because that happened didn't mean that I abandoned the mission. It's, it's the same thing for ECOWAS. I think this is turbulence. That happens in everybody, in every human life even, and even in the United Nations. And I'm very happy that um, we're having this very important discussion here in uh, one of the rooms of the most important institutions and in one of the most power, the cities that is one of the most powerful centers of the world. We don't need to be so panicked. This means that the greatest power in the world is aware of what is happening. Geopolitically and geostrategically, the, this great power is bringing real attention to it. The, the big countries that are monitoring this, they are truly monitoring what's happening. I don't think. I, I don't think that ECOWAS is, is permanently broken apart. I mean, these three countries that are in transition, 
despite the sudden awakening, the mature awakening of the youth with the new technology that they use, that are that are that are taking uh, these these countries and the Sahel Alliance, that are are gaining awareness, that are interested in sovereignty. If those countries are truly in transition, <laughs> let's let the transition happen. We'll see what happens when there's a new political regime. Maybe they will want to go back to ECOWAS. Those, they might do it. This is a political question. It's a question of political orientation according to, to, to what the feeling is when those decisions are made. And I, I won't hide from you. I was there in the field. I was in the, com the field of, of combat. I was fighting terrorism, uh, fighting against the issue of IDPs in Burkina Faso. M more than 80% of the, of the terrorists are Burkina Bay. What does that mean? It means that there is human insecurity it has, that has gotten so much worse. So what can we do that this land that you all know, that the United States knows very well, these lands that are so rich in minerals, in natural resources, and uh, young people who are so powerful, a population that is growing, that is developing. <laughs> Exponential growth. If the United States really realizes, and of course there's this rivalry with the, the great powers, but if they can really talk about it, I, I don't think it's fair to say that ECOWAS is broken. So the ECOWAS was unable to do anything about the coup d'état. They, they put in place sanctions. It didn't help. There was this uh, coup d'état in 23 in Niger that shocked everybody. Nothing could be done. It is difficult to say today that, no, ECOWAS is not uh, broken. It's difficult to say that. So uh, ECOWAS is not broken. But uh, as you said, let's start with Mali, because it is Mali that opened opened Pandora's box. So there I will throw the stone I will throw the stones to you too and to all of you in politics and policy. What bothers us in Africa is the elites. Let's be real about it. All the civilians that collaborate with the military that uh, have uh, taken power, they were within the government. When we speak of a third mandate, who votes these laws at the par in the parliaments to change the constitution? These are politicians. And that is the fundamental problem. That's the root of the problem. And I think that is, uh, if we want to speak of human security in our country, if we want to improve human security in our country, uh, I will champion the state if this takes place. In 2012, we had a revolution. In 2015, we voted for socialism. In 2015, oh, sorry, 1975, 1972, the revolution, 1975, the uh, revolution. And it was a military person who uh, was at the head of that regime. I was perhaps a student at the time. And uh, it was said, no, we cannot continue in the same way. But um, <laughs> we were using buses to go to the university, but in 89, when there was the economic decline in Benin, the president 
General Cariku in 89 said, yes, my, pop my people are suffering. He was the one who had the, uh, d the political speech towards socialism. He was the one who uh, took us in that direction. Before that speech, and in 1990, Abul had uh, also a speech on that level, but we did ours earlier. We, it was a 180-degree change, and we rapidly left socialism to the side, uh, and multilateralism came in. and. In 1990, I was there when this took place. And this uh, assembly of the people, we were 350 uh, who elected the prime minister. And we decided that the president, uh, in quote unquote dictator, uh, what are the lessons for today, General? Mm -hmm. I was giving you these examples to say that we can have chosen uh, X option today, such as leaving ECOWAS, and others, other politicians who will take power in the future, perhaps will, um, such as uh, said uh, the minister, Koulibaly, they can come back. Uh, the countries may ask to return to ECOWAS. So, uh, so the decisions that were taken by ECOWAS concerning Mali, it was not easy. It was not s simple. But, and I speak uh, be in front of witnesses, but what would have allowed civilians to stay in power? It is the same civilians that really uh, impeded this process. And you are witnesses to this. And then the military came. If the civilian politicians had not been so uh, unwilling to change and to have a meeting with uh, between ECOWAS and the president, perhaps there would not have been a coup d'etat. But the person who the author of this coup d'etat, a military man, was in the field. He was fighting against the terrorists. He was even made hostage by the terrorists. And I will finish by saying when men amongst you, people amongst you, experience critical situations that concern their personal life, that concern their troops, it is not to justify a coup d'etat. As a military, I would never have entertained a coup d'etat or participated in one. But when there's a great part of the population is faced a certain situation, and, and when the civilians uh, in power do not handle situations and problems, then sometimes the military feel that, OK, we're going to stop here. And we, uh, we cannot continue with the situation. So, so the fault is in the heads of the politicians and the civilians. Yes, and yes, and yes. But if you will allow me to continue, even the United States are not spared from this. Even the United States are not spared. It is very clear, very clear. I am in the capital of the United States. My general, please, please. Uh, I would like us to speak of the institution. It is very important. So I have a question for the Minister Koulibaly. You know the state, you know its uh, strengths, its weaknesses. So d should the side countries uh, take on strategic uh, reforms of their institutions? And how can the international partners who wish uh, the stability in the side, the US included, how can they assist of these uh, changes, these reforms, to be undertaken? So, so, um, yes. When we speak of the Sahel, 
We haven't, we've limited ourselves to Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, because they are in the headlines. But it is much more than that. Sahel, it's from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, it's a, a, that, that region, encompassed by that whole region. And so the Sahel must also include other countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, uh, Cap Verde. Cap Verde, it's the Atlantic, and it's uh, it's really a space that is extremely vast. So in 2050, which is tomorrow, two billion Africans, two 2.5 billion Africans uh, will represent one-fourth of the world population, and then uh, a few years later, it will be one-half of the population, of the world population. And looking at this, the Sahel today, the five countries, if we just look at the five mm -hmm. countries of the, the G5 Sahel, uh, they will be, they will represent 200 million people in 2050. If we look at this entire area of the Sahel, and even uh, we can speak of the Sah Sahara Sahel region, those states, that space represents no less than 30% of the African population. When you look at the growth uh, pr predictions, it's between a three to five percent uh, per year. When you look at the rate of fertility between uh, 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 six, uh, the very great fertility rate, it's really not even a demographic challenge. It's a demographic time bomb that awaits us. And within this population, the average age, for example, for countries such as Mali and Burkina, is between 16 and 17, the medium age. So if you look at the, if you know the pyramid of the ages and you just cut it in half, 75% are young people, are youth. So you can imagine the problems that this can set up. So we need partnerships, but to do what? What do we need these partnerships for? What? There is no institution that would be useful if it does not make its principal mission the prosperity of the people. You know I am a political activist since forever. I was in the student union. Uh, I went from being a communist to a liberal. Uh, I w first uh, became a militant in the uh, communist uh, union of students, and that was part of what I did. And then I, now I'm sort of, then I became uh, a businessman. I became sort of mainstreamed. But I can sa say that there is no institution that that should exist or can exist if it is not turned towards the prosperity and a particularly shared prosperity. And it's the same with partnerships. If a partnership is not geared towards prosperity for all, it should not exist. So future institutions of Sahelian states and everywhere in Africa, they should really uh, highlight one element that I feel is the most important, and that is education, education. The new technological sciences have a characteristic, a feature. They are factors that equalize everyone in society. So thanks to social media and thanks to um, AI and digi the digital world, uh, microchips, uh, the youth of Africa can immediately become up to par with the West. But this is only possible if we have already trained uh, the young people. Secondly uh, is agriculture. The second domain is agriculture. Once again, we must uh, 
leave these post-colonial agricultural institutions because people work hard, uh, but all their but all the raw materials are exported. We export gold, we the cotton that's going to make uh, the Levi's uh, in a foreign country that I will buy later in Africa. So. That's a problem. All of our raw materials are exported. We are only exporting our raw materials. We are very little, ve we are not involved enough in um, the fabrication, in manufacturing ourselves. So we need to work towards the industrialization of Africa. We need fu institutions for the future so that those in charge in Africa they must fight for this. They must. They must make education a priority, especially in new technologies, uh, even for little girls, and also modern agriculture. Of course, there will be uh, uh, an effect. Uh, those who are living in rural areas, uh, the there will be new technologies and artificial intelligence that will provoke a certain level of urbanism. I think that in 2050, 60 percent of Africans will be living in urban areas and oftentimes in poverty. And so there will be delinquency and, and gangs and all sorts of problems. So there won't just be terrorism. There are phenomena of insecurity that linked to urban problems that have not been properly controlled or dealt with. So these decisions so, decisions which are coming in, which are taking decisions that will not, in my opinion, serve the economic interests of the region. We have to open up. Whatever the problem may be, whatever decisions may be, the president may be, in our African tradition, we need to agree to talk and not consult each other. So, for me, it's important. We cannot close ourselves off. These are really important. We can't let go of that. And then the United States, the greatest military power, the greatest economic power in the world, even the greatest scientific power, ultimately, all of those, the bosses, they now need to start thinking, step back and start thinking about changing the paradigm. You know, it's not. It's nothing new to say, I think. I think it's true for the United States. It's true for other great powers. Africa needs to be looked at differently. If only because global security and collective defense requires it. Africa needs to be looked at differently. And I really want to insist on this crisis of multilateralism, which is digging into this region with a kind of uh, uh, the, the, the rule of the biggest and the mightiest. So let's look at differently at questions of, of debt, for example, because that is often the only way to get Africans out of this economic breakdown. But we need to take a new look at the loans that are, are made to develop the African continent. We, we can't continue on with the current interest rates and with the periods, the current loan periods. The dates of these Sahel countries, we need to be need to be giving 20 to 25 years on current debt. I'm not even talking about future debt. I mean, a lot of analysts are saying that uh, 2024 will be the default year, the payment default year for a lot of countries. So urgently, and, and the U.S. can do this, the, the bosses can do this, they can do it. They can take that decision to, to lengthen the repayment period. And you have compatriots, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who have been thinking about that topic. He's quite interesting. Maybe it could be interesting to look at what he's been doing recently. I'm not always, I don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's working on some interesting things. We should revisit the, the payment period for current debt and then for future debt 
We need to create a whole new paradigm for that. The current framing of the Bretton Woods does not work. It will not work. It cannot work. And I'll conclude on that point. I want to remind you that in the 80s, there was the Structural Adjustment Plan. And that Structural Adjustment Plan destroyed the education sector in the Sahel. The education sector. All of a sudden, just taking the example of Mali, we had schools that had to divide students into two categories. They had morning school and then the afternoon school because there were not enough teachers. The state had to get rid of teachers because this structural adjustment plan imposed a reduction of the of payroll of of school payroll. Can you imagine in this post-colonial stage a, a state that was just starting out following the trauma of co uh, colonization after the great conflict of the War of Independence? Twenty years, just twenty years on. It did not help us reconstruct our nation. And we had these incidents that condemned an entire generation of young Africans. Don't be surprised that a decade later, you are seeing the problems that we saw in the 1990s. The, la bol, the, the, the speech, of course, it was a specific incident. But I remember I was young. In uh, 1980, 1981, there was the student strike in Mali, which was so violent. And the clandestine political organizations that fought against power, uh, Musa Traore at the time, but that was a symptom of things that had started so much earlier. Uh, uh, the, the French will have their own point of view on what happened then. But, uh, but, but there, are other, there were other things that happened before. And this policy of structural adjustment condemned, and I'm saying it again, condemned an entire generation of Africans. Not just teachers, but more so students. Students, our education system did not provide quality education for more than 30 years. And now we see the, the outcome. This is, uh, these are young people who are vulnerable to radicalization, who are often exposed to uh, to, to speech, to discourse that doesn't necessarily come from Africa, but uh, for, look, for 40 years we were seeing France, France bringing a certain discourse to the table, but we're seeing young people who never had the solid cultural grounding to be able to face those policies of influence. They were not able to resist, and so education is what counts. I absolutely agree. To support an economic system that is built on a whole new paradigm, I really insist on that. Scientific education for young Sahelian girls, it's so important. Thank you, Minister. I wish that we had more time to ask uh, questions about peace, security, and so on in Sahel, but I'm looking at the clock, and I think maybe we should move on to the uh, uh, answers now. Who wants to go first? So please, uh, some rules here. Uh, state your name, uh, institution, and a sentence with a question mark at the end. <laughs> Should I go uh, in French or in English? Uh, comme vous voulez. As you want. Okay, so uh, no, I think I will hear it in French because. Sorry about that, but. Uh, uh, hello, good afternoon, good morning. Thank you for your remarks. My name is Mr. Moucharou. I'm a doctoral student at Howard University. I am doing African studies. The minister said a lot of things that were very interesting. And in your conclusion in particular, when you spoke about the model of institutions that uh, needs to change its center of interest, needs to focus on prosperity, I think I was a bit confused by the fact that for me it seemed like the development models that are currently being used in Africa are models that are mostly taking into account the Western reality. 
And when we talk about security with these new countries, that are, are, are we taking into account the sensitivities of the population? These are the issues, are the models we use directly linked to the population? Do you think that these people or these new leaders, the new leaders in these countries have seized on something, have grasped something that has permitted a certain awakening, um, regardless of what the ultimate orienta political orientations might be? You also spoke about education. So what type of education do you think is best for Africa? Because also these days, this education is based on post-colonial models, which uh, often uh, turn, uh, uh, turn, turn Africans into parrots who just repeat what, what, they, what, what they've been told. And so I think that's an important question to be thinking about. But, but I agree with you on that point. But maybe you could just expand on it. That was two questions. Uh, Those were for, my, for me, right? Yeah, for the for the minister, for the general. Yes. So I talk about prosperity, and maybe it's surprising coming from a foreign minister of defense to be talking about we need a more economic solution rather than a military solution, because I think we've over-militarized various issues. You know, every time we opt for solely military solutions, we become increasingly dependent on, on our military in terms of GDP. And so there are, there's fallout for the health sector, the education sector, and so on. So these days, we need to rethink, because we're here to talk about peace and security. We, for those issues, we still need to have less military solutions, even though sometimes they are important for fighting terrorism, for example. But we need to prioritize uh, crisis resolution measures that uh, give more resources to economic solutions, cultural integration solutions, etc. And yes, of course, of course, we've been told uh, that in 1492, Columbus discovered America. Come on, that's not true. Abu Baku left, uh, went out and discovered things before him, and, dis and uh, okay, he discovered Indians, he discovered people who were already there, but that's what we were told at the time. Christopher Columbus discovered America. We learned that Marco Polo was a great champion. No. So anyway, I mean, I can go on with different examples like that. You know what we say? The day that animals learn to write, a lot of hunters will feel ashamed. People say, va evictis, uh, shame on the conquerors. Colonization, slavery, these are the results of military defeat. Well, uh, with slavery, there were other sort of complicit actors, but when we see the results of these military defeats, because one party was stronger than another, what happens next? After that, you have to reinvent. You have to reinvent yourself. It's important. It's important no matter who we are, wherever we come from. When something like that happens, we have to reestablish a certain historical truth, right? Other great intellectuals have done it. Uh, Sonika, there are others. I don't know if you've read uh, Roots. Mm -hmm. You should read it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. That corpus is there. That helps us revisit the principles of education for our youth. Because, and I'm, I, I digress uh, psychologically, maybe it's a cheap digression, but we have to learn to hold ourselves in greater esteem. This is extremely important. We're here in Washington. Our incest ancestors contributed to Washington, D.C. Just now, when we arrived, uh, we saw. We saw, oh, we went to the Lincoln Memorial. There was a famous speech that was given here. I'm happy to join with you today in what will go down in history mm -hmm. as the biggest demonstration of civil rights of our history. So we can be proud of these things, but I'm not one of those people who wants revenge. No. 
I want a happy, joyful, hardworking, and prosperous Africa. I don't want an Africa who's always at war. Even though we have to assert ourselves at the table, we have to say to the US government what we want and what we do not want. We have to say to the EU what we want and what we do not want. We must do that. But ultimately, if we decide to agree on certain decisions that have been made for us elsewhere, then we can't complain later. Thank you, Minister. Question? Excellent. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Madame Péchon, I'm from Cameroon. I have uh, benefited from a fellowship at uh, Cameroonian University. I would like to uh, ask you a simple question, because it seems like you're saying that ECOWAS is not broken, that it is not having problems. So I want to reframe the question. So what does ECOWAS plan to do? Because you know that as an African, Africans, we believe in ECOWAS, which is a strong example of uh, the protection of human rights and democracy in Africa. Well, okay, so if ECOWAS is not, account, is not broken, then it follows, and, and this is kind of my question, it follows, what can we expect from ECOWAS? There have been recommendations, there were threats that were then mitigated. What can we expect from ECOWAS? It is fortunate that what we are experiencing this morning, because there, there is a great thinker, Albert Einstein, I think there is a street named after him here in the American capital. He said, it is not those who do harm of whom we should be afraid. It is those who see uh, bad things, being evil being done, and do nothing to stop it. We have alluded, perhaps uh, voluntarily or involuntarily, the causes of the instability of the region, which is terrorism. This. This terrorism rooted itself, anchored itself in the poverty of the populations, in the precarity of the people, in the total absence of security, human security. And when I speak of human security, I, I join the minister in speaking of education, health, in the domains of uh, economic markets, of, uh, of uh, farming, and of also, we have seen that, that these terrorists come to the populations and say, in 48 hours, we will be there. They come, they take their herds, they, they destroy their, um, their culture, their uh, crops. And when did this start? So the first institution that came in 2012 was ECOWAS. It's very important what we must not forget, but we, that we do forget too quickly. Earlier I speak, yes, earlier I said it's very good that this conversation take place in the U.S. Capitol. It is a good sign. It is an important sign that terrorists and with those with who support them imagine 5,000 motorcycles, 10,000 motorcycles that, uh, that show up in a very arid uh, area and permit the terror, allow the terrorists to, to take action. Yeah. But it is not this that will allow the ECOWAS to intervene. No, I'm just looking at the sources of instability. So ECOWAS intervened, and then afterwards the president, Bika, uh, solicited assistance from France, from which the Operation Serval, mm -hmm. President Jukunda Akuli, he was the, pres the transitionary president, yes. And Ibeka, therefore, saw the French arrive, 
to fight terrorism, and Operation Serval stopped the progression of terrorism very clearly, quickly. The general who who uh, was in charge of this mission was a personal friend, and after that, there was Bakan. There was Menusma. Menusma was the uh, intervention of the international uh, community, but terrorism continued to evolve on the uh, on the ground. So the fundamental question we must ask: Menusma had thirteen thousand men, thirteen thousand troops sent by. 110 countries from the entire world, including the US, the first air power of the world, and also Russia and China, Turkey. If you want to give a name, I, all of these countries uh, were part of MINUSMA, and billions were spent. Uh, to fight uh, terrorists who were perhaps less than 10,000, and we were unable to defeat them because of the, because of politics, because of governance, because of the social and economic policies of these governments, the Sahel, the Mali, and so forth. The ECOWAS took important decisions while I was there as a commissioner of political affairs. And these decisions allowed the transitionary governments to, to, to reflect. But as you know, in every institution, there it can be a problem of leadership at a given time. I can tell you that the leadership of ECOWAS at a certain time uh, was weak. And the vision uh, played a role um, it, paid a role downstream by the uh, heads of state that participated in this uh, weakened vision. And as we said, there is a... Do you agree? Do you agree that uh, other... I can't read. Today, there are... There are um, at today issues with the heads of state. There are sanctions that uh, are included in the protocols of foreign affairs. At the time, at that time, while we were in the midst of all of this activity, we never impeded the foreign ministers to to move, to, to make decisions. And the last decisions taken in terms of Niger, I think that the decision of sending uh, troops to Niger from ECOWAS were taken, it was an emotional response. It was a sort of emotional response from the heads of state because each one of them asked them <laughs> What next? So there were three things that the politicians may or may not agree with. The first being uh, the conquest uh, of, of power. Secondly, is um, you have to achieve power, then you have to know how to manage it. So first you reach power, then you have to manage it, then you have to know how to conserve that power. And this is true in the entire world. If we, These three things uh, are true even here in the United States when the Republican Party is in power. It does not want to leave. When the conservatives are in power, they do not want to leave. All uh, By all means, necessary, they want to stay in power. So the reality that we are living currently in West Africa and the Sahel, and in terms of the decisions uh, that of things that have not come to a good conclusion, there's also the intervention of the media coming often from, and the, the intervention from the, 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 the big powers. So, to, so any news coming out of Washington today 
today is uh, is is heard throughout the world immediately. So, so the the whole problem stemmed from the lack of human security. So really, the the main conclusion of our discussion is that we must work towards the development of human security to assure human security. ECOWAS put in place a plan to fight uh, terrorism, uh, an action plan to fight terrorism. And it is myself uh, who uh, brought together all of the chiefs of staffs of all the including from Chad and from Mauritania. We put together an, uh, an action plan with eight pillars, uh, education, health, the development of infrastructure, uh, 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 border surveillance, coordination for a budget of $2,300,000 million. Dollars. And we received not a cent, not a penny. In 2020, from 2020 to 2024, I am the one who worked on, on this, uh, who put this plan together. I have it here with me, if you allow, Madam Ambassador. Here is the plan. Here is the action plan. It is in English and in French. But when the war in Ukraine uh, surfaced. It was a geopolitical uh, issue. The 44 billion quickly went to Ukraine, whereas we said we only need 2.3 billion dollars to uh, stop, put an end to terrorism. So there won't be coup d'etat, so democracy can be developed, so human security can be uh, guaranteed. And this is why I say that what is happening today is extremely important, and I thank you all to have uh, brought together this meeting. Thank you. Uh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. When I say, I don't Great. say that the motor is broken. I say it's um, stalled. And so it needs to be repaired. I want to be very, very clear on that. It is stalled, but it is not broken. It's in disrepair. Thank you. ECOWAS. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup fellow with a member of Congress, um, specifically Congresswoman Sheila Surfless McCormick. She is on the House of Foreign Affairs Committee Good. and specifically the subcommittee on Africa. And so she's closely following this whole situation in the region and what's going on with ECOWAS. And so what we wanted to know specifically is, you know, what you all think. I know the Marshall Plan was mentioned, as well as, you know, changing the time frame for the loans, the repayment of loans. But we wanted to know, I guess aside from that, what you think if there's anything that specifically Congress can do, or, or you know, what you would like us to do in order to basically help the, basically the democratic crisis that's occurring in the region. Thank you, I love the question. Ambassador Williams. Um, so don't tell the Congresswoman Marshall Plan because she'll throw out the piece of paper. <laughs> but what I do think is really important, there de I believe there has to be much more economic investment. And so there are structures that could use. MCC is an example of something the United States government is trying to do to encourage infrastructure investment. But there are some problems with MCC in that, um, well, you can call them conditionalities, some of which, of course, are our principles. But um, uh, we need to rethink that. And to the extent that we can connect these countries that need electricity, that need road work, that need um, investment in their educational systems. I think those are the kinds of programs that um, our Congress can look at and put a higher priority on, and we haven't. We haven't created an incentive program that, that makes it easier for um, American companies that want to do work in the Sahel, and even for the university partnerships and collaboration, collaboration on the medical front. Um, the, there are ways where we can build infrastructure support that's going to help towards this human security that, that um, was just alluded to. So, um, so refashioning a specific um, MCC 
slash Sahel type program, I think would be something that be, would be very important to look at. The notion of um, getting civil society engagement and the idea of um, um, populations not having confidence in their elite, the elite equals the political class very often. And so there does have to be a different kind of engagement that um, Congress should have with uh, other kinds of, with, with, the, with the middle class that's not a political class. Um, but at the same time, I think if Congress had a little bit more engagement with the various national assemblies in these countries, I think that also is very important. Very often they send staffers, but you don't see a lot of cross communication. Some of these, when I was ambassador in Niger, sometimes they said, we don't know how to draft certain kinds of legislation. How would you frame such a thing? And I think the kinds of exchanges on that level, um, how do we set up an, an environmental protection regime, for example? How do you really set up a regime that's going to be uh, looking at corruption um, and, and graft in within, uh, within the state? Uh, I think those kinds of things are, are if our Congress were to demonstrate that kind of interest in their counterparts um, and in what's going on there, I think that would get a lot of people's attention. And that would show the, the public, civil society, that the United States still cares. Because we're, we're beginning to lose that, um, that glow to that battle. Thank you. And in our CSI group report, there are specific recommendations for Congress. Please take a copy. <laughs> Dernière question, et nous concluons. Mm -hmm. from Hello to all. I'm Ambassador of Mali, the chef of mission, actually, I was. It's an honor to see my two, uh, uh, Madame Lise, uh, two of my prior um, supervisors. We worked on missions together at the, in the, for the elections of Cote d'Ivoire in 2020. <coughs> so thank you for these exchanges. Before continuing, I would like to make a suggestion. Uh, if this, would it be useful, should this happen again, to have uh, officials f uh, from these countries concerned by this question, perhaps having them present also, that would better enable to open this discussion. I would like to also uh, come back to a few comments that were made. Especially comments about the involvement of ECOWAS on, in uh, anti-terrorism. I think we have to note that ECOWAS started to deploy in December t uh, 2012, and it and and it changed status to to have uh, uh, MISMAR in, in 2013. And this was not a, a political mission; it, it was a, a peace initiative uh, for MINUSMA, But the that. But that ex exacerbated the issues in the region for the population, and we saw what happened. So that was for MINISMA. But in terms of the three countries, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, what's important is to know that we shouldn't be limited to statements or to be talking about leaving ECOWAS. But we have to look at these uh, three big issues, uh, collective defense, uh, diplomacy, amongst others. So these states are not closed off. They are open to others on these bigger collaborative issues. So we have to be thinking about partnerships, but still respecting the sovereignty of states. And I think that's an important point, because to go back to the comment, <laughs> do you have a question? Yes, but this is just the comment part. To go back to Ambassador Williams, we need conversation. We can't have a situation where the US, for example, sees our countries as pariahs. No, we, they need to improve communication and conversation. I'll stop there. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to conclude this discussion, uh, which I'm sure will continue in the hallway. I would like to thank Ambassador Williams. Thank you, Minister Koulibaly. It was an honor to have you with us. And General Bianzon, thank you for your travel to come here.